Welcome to the Belly Button Window Channel and Episode 22 Part 1 of the Jimi Hendrix Story, like you've never heard it before. In this episode, we commence the deep dive into May of 1968, including the Fillmore East concert and the Miami Pop Festival as well as the recording of the Electric Ladyland album. Please remember to check the channel's community tab and video information page, where you will find links to related videos, performances, and stunning photographs from the period. With the band now in the studio focused on recording for their third album, Noel described how the recording process had changed. The approach we used for Are You Experienced and Axis was work from the format of knowing the basic chords, get a rough tempo, and agree the break positions. After that, we would run through a couple of times to get the feel and get our individual contributions sorted out. With 12 tracks, however, mixing became a bigger part of the process, and Jimmy and Chaz tended to get carried away. Jimmy in particular was entranced by new electronic effects, as well as the possibilities afforded by complicated overdubbing. And the lovely simplicity of our earlier recordings got lost. Instead of just playing the songs through a couple of times and get going to a take, Jimmy began to function as a director. This might have worked, but his attempts to verbalize his ideas just didn't. He'd lose his train of thought, skip to something else, and fail to convey to us what he was up to. While Mitch recalled, we block booked the studio through the night. The usual thing was we'd go down to the scene to play and hang out, and then go around to the studio, which was only a couple of blocks away. Huge amounts were spent, not just on studio time, but on stupid things like having a limo on call the whole time. Hendrix would turn up with endless streams of people, so to get any kind of work done was really difficult. Looking back, it was amazing that the album was finished. In the end, the bulk of it got done in about a month, although at the time it seemed to take forever. Also, Noel reacted badly to the idea of guest musicians, whereas Jimmy and I loved it. It was one of the finest things in life. I mean, how lucky can you be to work with all those people in and out of the studio? Wednesday, the 1st of May, sees the Jimi Hendrix experience at the Record Plant Studios, New York, with Eddie Kramer and Chaz Chandler working on the recordings, Gypsy Eyes, House Burning Down, and Tax Free. In addition to the Wah Wah and Octavia, Jimmy starts using another type of effect, whereby the guitar passes through a Leslie cab, generally used for the Hammond organ. This effect creates swirling sounds heard on studio versions of Little Wing and House Burning Down. Also, the experience is featured in the May 1968 edition of Super Love magazine. According to Hendrix author John McDermott, on May 1st playing rhythm guitar and with Mitch and Noel accompanying, Hendrix cut House Burning Down, another track that had begun as a demo in London, and for the third time, the basic tracks of the Gypsy Eyes were recorded. Now it was finally deemed finished. Although, even so, Hendrix would overdub and remix the song no fewer than five times in order to achieve the effect he desired. The experience also tried to complete tax-free, choosing not to transfer the work on the best take on four-track at Olympic in January, but to recut the title entirely. Once again, the sound or feel Hendrix sought from the song eluded him. Thursday, the 2nd of May, and the group is back at the record plant working on the studio recordings of the tracks. Three Little Bears, Cherokee Mist, Feedback and Electric Sitar Version, South Saturn Delta, and Voodoo Child. On the same day, the Jimi Hendrix experience is featured in the Village Voice newspaper. Noel Redding recalled, As the recording process got stretched out into marathon twiddling sessions, an audience grew in the studio. Legions of hangers-on who contributed nothing to the music, but were there solely for the trip. Chaz, who had nurtured the experience from the beginning, was getting fed up. He had successfully produced the first two albums, but now found himself stymied by Jimmy's demands for control. And... On the 2nd of May I took it out on Jimmy, letting him know what I thought of the scene he was building around himself. Taking a break from the session, Hendrix leads an entourage to their local hangout at the scene club for some fun. Then Hendrix, Mitch Mitchell, Eddie Kramer, Winwood, Cassidy, Larry Coriel and others return to the record plant to jam. These jams would become the basis of Voodoo Child. The recording of Three Little Bears took place at the record plant, where Steve Winwood, Jack Cassidy, and a host of others visited the group. Although Hendrix originally came up with the title Cherokee Mist for the session, he later settled on Three Little Bears as the final working title. Throughout the session, Jimmy developed a jazzy rhythm pattern that would become South Saturn Delta. As the session progressed, 
Hendrix and bass player Noel Redding argued over the number of people in the studio. Friday the 3rd of May. At the record plant, recording Voodoo Child, Slight Return. Noel noted in his diary, The session was being filmed. We played the same number all day long. Later, Jimmy participates in a jam session with Mitch Mitchell and Joe Tex. On the same day, the experience is featured in Go Magazine, where the Are You Experienced LP sits at number 12 in the magazine's top 20 album charts and the East Village Other newspaper. Saturday, the 4th of May, Noel noted, I showed up to the studio but no one else did. At least there were no crowds. So I redid some bass lines in Peace and Quiet and later had a fantastic blow with jazzer Larry Coriel, who turned out to be an adept rock and roller. Also on May 4th, 1968, the Jimi Hendrix Experience is featured in the Melody Maker Music Magazine. Sunday the 5th of May, at the Record Plant Recording Studios, recording Voodoo Child, Slight Return, House Burning Down, Walking Through the Garden. The third part of the session was filmed. Monday the 6th of May, Noel Redding attends a Tim Rose concert, then later jams with the McCoys and others. Tuesday the 7th of May, at the Scene Club in New York City, Noel Redding participates in a jam session with guitarist Larry Coriel with Robert Wyatt on drums. Wednesday the 8th of May, Record Plant Studios, Recording and Mixing, Voodoo Child, Three Little Bears, Long Hot Summer Night and 1983, A Moment I Should Turn to Be. Around this date Chaz Chandler leaves the production of the album, Electric Ladyland. This must have been good news to Jimmy, who around this time in interview said, Above all, our records will become better, purely from the point of view of recording technique. We have not been happy with a single one. Our producer up to now, Chaz Chandler, has not had the right feel when he turned the wheels in the control room. In the future, we will take care of that detail ourselves, together with Dave Mason, who has quit traffic to spend time on this, among other things. While Kathy Etchingham provided this account from Chandler, later, Chaz told me how impossible it had become to get Jimmy to do anything in America. Chaz would tell him that he had to get into the studio to lay down some tracks, and Jimmy would shrug and say, yeah, when I feel like it. Sometimes he would disappear for days on end, and then he would invite different people to be his manager or producer, or take part on his albums none of whom his actual management wanted. He would make glowing promises he couldn't keep to anybody who happened to be around. He always had the tendency to tell people what they wanted to hear. If somebody he was talking to was into jazz, Jimmy would tell them he was planning to do more of it. If they liked blues, he was planning to move more in that direction. He also had a real difficulty in saying that to anyone about trivial things, and when he finally got round to it, perhaps because they started to take advantage, he would do it in an insulting and abusive way, having suddenly reached the end of his tether. He evidently thought he had a better handle on things than Chaz and had managed to push Chaz beyond the point of no return. Friday the 10th of May, and the band performs two shows at the Fillmore East, New York City. Set list for the first show. I Don't Live Today, Red House, Purple Haze, Hey Joe, Loverman, Fire, Foxy Lady, and Wild Thing. And for the second show, Loverman, Fire, Foxy Lady, Red House, Hey Joe, Sunshine of Your Love, Hear My Train Are Coming, Can You Please Crawl Out Your Window, Purple Haze, and Wild Thing. On the same day, the Jimi Hendrix experience is featured in the East Village Other newspaper. The following is a Fillmore review titled Hendrix injects humor into the night, double billed with Sly and the Family Stone, whose music Jimmy loved, the experience roared through two sets. During one of the several technical delays, Hendrix announced that it was nice to be in Miami Beach, Florida, and launched into the Beach Boys' Surf in USA before abruptly stopping. In mock shock, he then apologized for the slip. I'm sorry, I had a big flash. Oh, my head, something just told me to play that. He then played a snatch of Eddie Cochran's Summertime Blues before Redding requested, Do that bit again, it was lovely. Do that for me, whatever it was. As Noel tried to hum, Surf in USA, Hendrix laughed to the crowd. Oh, yeah, Summertime Blues, do you remember that? Jimmy then tried to explain reasons for the impromptu comedy. We're doing this because we don't know what song to play next. When a fan let loose with an indecipherable yelp, Hendrix picked up on it without missing a beat. Yeah, we'll play that next. Versions of Hear My Trainer Comin', with Hendrix playing some of the solo with his teeth and Lover Man, simply Rock Me Baby, reinvented with different lyrics, rocked the sold-out auditorium. Cryptically, Hendrix instructed the crowd to Please crawl out your window or else I'll put a curse on you and all your children will be butt-naked.
The experience put the final touch on the magnificent Dylan interpretation with a sudden, surprise ending. Despite the recurring amplifier problems, the experience were all their PR promised they would be. Loud, brash, cocky and marvellously talented. The frequent delays had made the Fillmore crowd especially rowdy. Replying to a fan who asked if Jimmy was better than Clapton, Hendrick stopped and, and to the delight of the audience, said, You say am I better than Clapton, right? Are you better than my girlfriend? To another who yelled to Hendrix to take off his hat, he replied, I'll take it off if you take off your pants. While this commentary was written by Alan Bershaw, this show captures the Jimi Hendrix experience headlining over Sly and the Family Stone at the Fillmore East. Mid-1968 is arguably the best possible time to have caught Hendrix in concert. He was playing at his most joyful and carefree, and the trappings of success haven't yet taken a toll on his mental health. He was also developing, at an incredible rate during this time, and beginning work on the Electric Ladyland album, which would find him experimenting more than ever before. This set catches Hendrix in a very comfortable and playful mood, and engaging in humorous dialogue with the audience. At one point someone yells, Take off your hat, Jimmy, to which he replies, I'll take off my hat if you take off your pants, amidst cheers and laughter from the audience. The performance kicks off with Lover Man, a song currently in development, and this arrangement is significantly different than the recorded version, and with a lot more frenetic energy. They continue with typically searing versions of Fire and Foxy Lady, but it's the slow burn of Red House that begins hitting stratospheric levels. This version is really beyond words. Jimmy is definitely tapped into something, and this 15-minute version has all the emotion and deep thoughtful playing that he was known for. By popular demand, they continue with Hey Joe, which also gets an extended treatment. Following this, Jimmy toys with the audience by launching into Cream's Sunshine of Your Love for about a minute before letting it fall completely apart. Obviously itching to continue where he was heading with Red House, he begins another slow blues with Hear My Trainer Come In. Again, there's nothing more delicious than Hendrix playing the blues, and this is a prime example. At this point, the band whips up a loose rendition of the Bob Dylan obscurity, Please Crawl Out Your Window. Jimmy was deep into Bob Dylan made apparent by covering this unknown Dylan tune. The set closes with a typically pulverizing version of Purple Haze. Here it is played with a feedback-drenched improvisational intro sequence that alludes to things that would surface in his Star-Spangled Banner rendition the following summer. This sequence lasts several minutes before they actually fly off into the song. This was an amazing Hendrix performance from a time when Jimmy wasn't yet plagued by outside forces. While Mitch recalled that one of the problems with the Electric Ladyland period was that we hardly played live while we were recording it. Consequently, when we did not play live, we weren't as sharp as we might have been. I remember we did the Fillmore East during that time. I felt comfortable playing, but the lack of playing gigs did make it that much tougher for all of us. While on the legal front, due to the lifting of Judge Metzner's temporary injunction, the record company PPX is increasing the pressure on Jimmy's management. By court order, all of Hendrix's record royalties from Warner Brothers seat, his touring money from the General Artists Corporation, and proceeds from the May 10th Fillmore concert are frozen. Before the show at the Fillmore, Jimmy and promoter Bill Graham received briefings from PPX attorney Elliot Hoffman. A photo, taken backstage at the Fillmore, shows Hendrix and his manager Mike Jeffrey in a serious discussion. Saturday the 11th of May. In New York, the group signed several contracts. On the same day, the Jimi Hendrix experience is featured in the following music magazines and newspapers. Record Mirror, where the Smash Hits LP sits at number 16 in the LP charts. Disc and Music Echo, Melody Maker, and New Musical Express, where the Smash Hits album is sitting at number 6 in the top 15 LPs list. Wednesday, the 15th of May. The Jimi Hendrix experience is featured in an article appearing in Go Set magazine. Friday, the 17th of May, and the group is back at the record plant, working on Gypsy Eyes. On the same day, the experience is featured in the following music and underground publications. The East Village Other, the Argus Courier Petaluma, the Rat Subterranean News, and Go Magazine where the top 20 albums chart features Are You Experienced at number 17 and Axis at number 19. Saturday the 18th of May, and the Jimi Hendrix experience is featured in the publications Melody Maker and New Musical Express where the NME Top 15 LPs features smash hits at number 6. 
Saturday 18th and Sunday 19th of May sees the experience performing two shows at the Miami Pop Festival, Gulfstream Racetrack, Hallandale, Miami. Linda Eastman greets them as they arrive. Set list for the first show. Tax free, Foxy Lady, Fire, Hear My Train are coming, and Purple Haze. And for the second show, Hey Joe, Fire, I Don't Live Today, Foxy Lady, Red House, and Purple Haze. Harry Shapiro and Caesar Glebeek provide this excellent overview of the event. The Miami Pop Festival was masterminded by 22 year old Michael Lang, originally from Brooklyn, who had opened Florida's first head shop. But his cherubic hippie appearance and shy manner hit a very sharp businessman. Captivated by the success of Monterey, he pulled together a group of investors under the name Joint Productions, whose purpose would be to stage a series of rock concerts at the Gulfstream racetrack near Miami Beach. The bill for the first three-day event included the Mothers of Invention, John Lee Hooker, Arthur Brown, Chuck Berry, and Jimmy. Day one was a great success. 25,000 came to watch bands play on three flatbed trucks, brought in so there would be no waiting between acts. One would be warming up, while the other will be performing. A fireworks display heralded the grand finale, a 40-foot high peace symbol blazing in the sky. Unfortunately, that was the last thing to blaze at the Gulf Stream track apart from tempers. Part of the second day and all of the third day were washed out by rainstorms. Nobody wanted to play for fear of electrocution, and the event was cancelled. Then came the ticklish problem of payment joint productions was out of pocket by $60,000. Lang had hired an ex-cop from Fort Lauderdale to guard the takings. He in turn took on some of his own men to assist. When it became clear that the festival had lost heavily, this group attempted to stop a Brinks security truck taking what money there was to a local bank. The cop's idea was that he and his men would lock themselves in the counting room to make sure they got paid in cash before any money was taken out of the grounds. They reached the room at the same time as the Brinks men who had come with Michael Lang to collect the cash. All of it. Both the Brinks men and the security force were armed. Also waiting in the office waiting for payment was Jerry Stickles, accompanied by Jimmy, Noel, Mitch, and the era apparent guitarist Mick Cox. Whether or not the potential shootout between the Brinks and festival security, the boys, was a charade to get out of paying is hard to say. But Michael Lang disappeared to New York while things cooled down. His next venture was Woodstock. According to Hendrix author John McDermott, with the experience playing at their best, the focus was to capture it on tape, and as Noel noted, live gigs began to be recorded to ensure that there would be enough material in the can to spin things out. The experience had been booked to play at the Miami Pop Festival, held at Gulfstream Park on May 18th and 19th, and a decision was made to tape the performances. Recording of Electric Ladyland was halted, and Eddie Kramer flown down, along with New York photographer Linda Eastman, hired by Michael Goldstein to document the event, to supervise. In Miami, the experience had been booked on a bill, which also featured Frank Zappa, NRBQ, Chuck Berry, and a number of other top stars. As had been the case with most other festivals, however, the real action took place elsewhere. The experience jammed through the night at their hotel, The Castaway. In time for Saturday's performance just for fun, Linda Eastman tinted blonde streaks throughout Jimmy's hair. Sunday's performance was washed out by torrential rains, and there was a mad dash back to the gaggle of limousines. Linda Eastman climbed into the wrong one, finding herself alone with Chuck Berry. True to character, Berry told Eastman he didn't mind if the concert was cancelled as long as he got paid. While Eddie Kramer and Hendrix were stuck in traffic, the events of the weekend inspired Jimmy to write the lyrics for Rainy Day, Dream Away in the Limousine. Mitch had this to say about the event, the other gig around that time was the Miami Pop Festival. It was suggested we should do it, as it was a prestige gig. There never had been much of a rock situation in Florida, but someone obviously thought it would be a good idea. It was held at Gulfstream Park Racecourse and was organized by this guy Marshall Brevitz, who apparently handed over wads of cash to Mike Jeffrey, which we never saw. We'd been out partying the night before, got to bed about seven, so by the afternoon show we were pretty tired. Anyway, this guy comes along and says, Hey guys, I've got a little something here to perk you up. And through foolishness, Hendrix and I accepted. We never did find out exactly what it was, except it was a big mistake. We got on stage, and on the second number, I looked up and saw the guy who gave us the powder in a lighting tower about 25 feet above the stage. Suddenly, I was on the same level as him, looking down at this empty shell playing the drums. 
I looked across and there's Jimmy up there with me. And we kind of look at each other and nod, kind of gig going okay so far. I have no idea if this was fact or fiction. It was straight out of the twilight zone. It was really the first time we'd gone through that situation because we'd been spiked and badly at that. We looked down and saw Noel, who definitely knew something was going on. He looked totally bewildered. Musically, it was fine, and we did our set and were looking forward to the second show at 7.30 p.m. or something like that. Suddenly, one of those huge thunderstorms appeared. The sort you only get down there and the second show was cancelled. Rain stopped play. In a piece titled Photographing Jimi Hendrix at the Radical, 1968 Miami Pop Festival music photographer Ken Davidoff, in an interview with Kathy Buccio of The Standard Culture, provided the lowdown on how he talked his way into the festival and what it was like to photograph Hendrix at his peak. The Standard. They say that the Miami Pop Festival made way for Woodstock. How did the festival open the doors for other great artists? Ken Davidoff. The idea of having a multi-day rock festival was unique to promoters. Michael Lang and Rick O'Barry were friends living in Coconut Grove. Michael had just opened the first head shop in South Florida, and Rick was the trainer for all five dolphins in the show Flipper, along with close friend Fred Neal. They would hang out with the dolphins and play music for them. One day they came up with the festival idea and ran with it. They first thought it would be at the Seminole Reservation, but the timing was too short. They decided on Gulfstream Park and booked the acts with the help of Marshall Brevitz, who ran one of the biggest concert venues in Miami, called The Image. Michael Lang said that the May 18, 1968, Miami Pop Festival was where the seeds of Woodstock were sown. It's been said that you talked your way into the festival, and the rest is history. Is that true? I did sort of talk my way in. I had a press ID from the Sheriff's Department in Palm Beach County that pretty much got me in anywhere I wanted to go in South Florida, and I took advantage of that fact. As far as going to Miami to photograph Jimmy, I was preparing for that festival several weeks in advance. I made arrangements to meet some friends that lived near the venue, and I went with my two best friends at the time. My buddy convinced his girlfriend to drive us to Gulfstream Park, and soon after, Jimi Hendrix was in my camera viewfinder. What was it like getting those shots of Jimi? Photographing Jimi Hendrix was one of the highlights of my career in rock concert photography, and was a great way to start it off. I had only photographed concerts in closed venues, and this was on a whole new level. The atmosphere of the open-air venue and the solid vibes of hardcore Jimmy fans was as intense as Jimmy's performances. That's right, Jimmy played twice on May 18th, once in the daytime and again that evening. I had two opportunities, but in reality, I would only have one. At the evening performance, I was using a very powerful strobe to light my shots. I took a full length of Jimmy and moved in for a close-up. Then, pow, from maybe just ten feet away, I hit Jimmy with this powerful amount of light. There was a pause and I thought I heard him say, no more flash. So I stopped taking pictures. In reality, we found out by researching for my book, The Miami Pop Festival, a photographic experience, that Jimmy was complaining about the spotlight that was zooming in and out on him. The lighting director, Zed Bennett from The Image, was running a spotlight as well as the liquid light show, and Jimmy was having none of that bright light in his face. What was it like backstage at the festival? I had a very strange event happen backstage. My camera bag was just that, a bag with no compartments. Just throw everything in it and go. A bad decision to say the least. There were some drawbacks with the camera that I had at that festival. I had to pre-focus, walk backwards and shoot. My film only let me take 12 photos at a time. And then I had to put in a new roll, usually while walking backwards to keep up with Jimmy's arrival. As I was in the middle of all this confusion, this guy walks up to me with an outstretched hand with my film in it. It seems like with all of that jostling for position, I must have tipped the camera bag or something because I was just handed back unexposed and exposed film. What a disaster that would have been to lose all of that hard work. According to Noel, the Miami Pop Festival gig was excellent, and when the second day's show was rained out, Jimmy and I headed to the hotel for a jam and general craziness with Arthur Brown, Steve Paul, the Mothers of Invention, and Blue Cheer. Also that weekend, as well as jamming at the Image Club, Miami. Jimmy also jams with the blues image at the rec bar at the Castaways Hotel, Miami playing an SFV Starfire Deluxe guitar. Tuesday, the 21st of May, and Jimmy participates in a jam session with Stephen Stills. Also, Eric Barrett joins the Jimi Hendrix experience as road manager. Noel recalled, 
The amount of gear grew on each tour. Amps fried regularly, speakers fluttered and died. Roadies came and went. Stickles was in for the whole run. H, X Pretty Things joined. Then Eric Barrett joined. Then Neville Chester's, X Who, BG's, Mersey Beats. Neville left and Eric Barrett joined for this tour. H left and Upsy joined. To give them their full due, they handled things very smoothly. Our gear was so huge and heavy, I could barely lift any of it. As an example, one of my amp and speaker setups weighed about 165 pounds and was about six feet high. To give the airlines credit too, little got damaged. This was a big change from carrying my guitar in one hand and my Fender Bandmaster amp in the other. Wednesday the 22nd of May, and at the Record Plant Studios, the group focuses on mixing and doing overdubs to 1983, a merman I should turn to be. That concludes this installment of the series. Stay tuned for the next episode, where we will continue with the deep dive into May of 1968 of the Hendrix story, including the Italian tour, the Monster Concert in Switzerland, along with more about the recording of their third album, Electric Ladyland. Don't forget to subscribe for future content updates. And by the way, if you have any stories, pictures or anecdotes to contribute, we would love to hear from you. Best wishes and always remember in the inimitable words of Jimmy, let your fancy flow.